Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Doing a series called Beauty for Ashes. The foundation scriptures for that series is Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, that says, He gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. When we come into a relationship with Christ, we enter into a divine exchange. He takes all the junk and the bad stuff that we've got and gives us all of his good stuff. I shared an example last night that we can understand really quickly. When I married Dave, I didn't have a car and he had a car, but as soon as I said I do, suddenly I had a car. And so that works the same way with God. He's righteous, we're unrighteous, but as soon as we receive Christ, we get God's righteousness as a gift given to us. Amen? God gives us faith, He gives us hope, He gives us joy, He gives us peace. He puts a seed of the fruit of the Spirit in us. When you receive Christ as your Savior, it's no little thing. I mean, there is just a wonderful wealth of great things downloaded into your spirit. But the things in our spirit have to grow and develop. That happens as we study the Word, spend time with God. And a work has to be done in our soul. Right now, tonight, if you're born again, you have absolutely zero problems in your spirit. But you could still have a lot of problems in your soul. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. It tells us what we want, what we think, and how we feel. So gradually over a period of time, the Holy Spirit works with us to do a work in our soul, to renew our mind, to help us get to the point where we can control those emotions, not live emotionally, but learn to be stable. He helps us turn our will over to Him, and He, he helps us learn how to control our mouth. How many of you are in that process right now? You're working with God in all these things. Because you see, here's the bottom line. No matter what we have going on in our spirit, if it can't get through our soul, nobody else out there is going to see it. Amen? How many of you realize that sometimes you give your life to Christ and uh, nobody can see a change? Why? Because there's nothing that's changed. We haven't let what God's done in our spirit work its way out to our soul. One of the first things you need to do is renew your mind, and that's what you're doing here tonight. Everything that I'm saying to you is helping you think a little bit different than you were when you came in here. Amen? How many of you are already starting to think a little bit different than you did maybe before last night? You realize that, hey, I don't have to live like that. Just because I got hurt sometime, that doesn't mean that I have to stay hurt all my life. God has a healing for me. And I'm going to work with Him and receive that healing in my life. Well, tonight we want to talk about the dangers of impulsive behavior. Because people that have wounded emotions... In the process of being healed, before they're healed, and even once in a while after they're healed, but not nearly as often, can be very impulsive. Do things emotionally. Do things without thinking. Do things without using wisdom. Now, we're always going to have emotions, but what we can't do is let them have us. We need to learn how to manage our emotions and not let them rule and control us. Well, when a person has been wounded, when they've been hurt, then their emotions are really out of control and out of whack. And depending on how bad you've been hurt, that can kind of dictate how far out of control you are emotionally. Anger is an emotion that many people have who have been hurt. I was an angry person. I got angry very quickly. When I didn't get my way, I got angry. When I had trials and tribulations, I got angry. When I would see other people blessed many times, I would be angry because I didn't understand why my life had been so hard and theirs seemed to be so easy. Anger is a huge problem. James 1.20 says that anger does not promote the righteousness that God desires and that a man should be slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. Anger is a very dangerous emotion. It's one letter away from danger. So we need to be careful and let God work with us about anger. Many people are mad at God. Honestly, they're trying to serve a God that they're angry at. 
Some people have gotten so angry about not understanding things in their life that have happened to them that they've walked away from God. And that's obviously not you because you're here tonight, but it may be many people that have come across this program and thought you'd just listen for a minute to see what I had to say. There's still a spark of something in you that wants that relationship with God restored. And I'm just telling you that God is not the author of our problems. Well, you might say, well, I had a situation, I was being abused, and God didn't get me out of it. Why didn't he get me out of it? He could have gotten me out of it. You know, I've discovered something in my life. I'm never going to be happy if I have to have, to have the answers to everything. I said, we're never going to be happy if we have to have the answers to everything. We have a great privilege of trusting God. I don't understand all that. I prayed during the years that my father was sexually abusing me. I had actually received Christ as my Savior when I was a nine-year-old child. And although I thought it never really did me much good because I never got any training after that, I realized that God was with me in a strong way. And although he didn't get me out of the situation, and I know I can explain some of that. I don't have time to do that tonight. But the thing that he did do for me was he gave me the strength to go through it. And I'm still here, and I'm healthy and alive and well, and I have got something very loud and clear to say about God's goodness and restorative powers in our lives because I have experienced it in my own life. So even though we don't understand this, sometimes God will permit us to go through something instead of delivering us from it because he's equipping us to minister to gazillion other people that are never going to find Christ if they don't have your witness and your testimony. So here's the bottom line. You can drive yourself crazy with questions you're never going to have answers to, or you can choose to trust God. And trusting God is a choice. You can choose tonight to just say, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to trust him, and I'm going to stop all this trying to figure out why. Some of us, if we got some of the answers that we'd like to have that would make us more miserable, they wouldn't help us. Amen? Don't be mad at God. Do not be mad at God. Some of you might be angry at yourself. That's a form of anger. I was angry at myself. I know a girl who's very angry at herself because she couldn't be perfect. A lot of perfectionists spend a lot of time angry at themselves because they can't do everything right all the time. I was angry at myself because I thought, well, something was wrong with me. If my father wanted to do that to me, then what was wrong with me? You got to forgive yourself. You got to become your own best friend. God wants you to have a good relationship with you. Your relationship with God and your relationship with yourself is the foundation of all your relationships with other people. If you don't get along with you, you're not going to get along with other people. And then we get angry at all the people that hurt us. A lot of anger in the world. Some people explode and some people implode. Some people are aggressive and bold about their anger. They're impulsive about their anger. I was like that. I was angry and loud and you knew it when I was angry. But then there are other people who keep it inside and they, they seethe inside, but they have a frozen smile on their face and act like everything's okay. And those people can have everything from a complete nervous breakdown to panic attacks, all kinds of stress, anxiety, depression, lots of other things. So it's best to be honest about where we're at. Talk to God openly and honestly. Get the help that you need and get beyond all these things. I said last night that there's no way that you can get to where you need to be if you won't face where you're at. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, we're instructed to not let the sun go down on our anger. Don't go to bed angry. When you're angry, don't sin. Don't ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, and your indignation last until the sun goes down. The next verse says, give the devil no foothold in your life. If you're angry tonight at someone who's hurt you, the best thing that you can do is forgive them. Well, you say they don't deserve it. That we're not talking about deserve. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve the the forgiveness of God, but he gives it to us. And he wants us to give away what he's given us and to forgive the people that have hurt us. 
It's not really about doing them a favor. When you forgive all the people that have hurt you, you're doing yourself a bigger favor than you're doing for anybody else because you're setting yourself free. You are setting yourself free. I've done all kinds of teaching on forgiveness. I've got a book called Do Yourself a Favor, Forgive. I've got teaching CDs on forgiveness. If you harbor grudges and you are angry still at people that have hurt you, I implore you to get the help that you need from the Word of God and get to the point where you, you can forgive somebody before they're finished hurting you because you realize that it's a trap that Satan has tried to draw you into and you're not going to live angry. So often we don't want to deal with stuff. We hide from it. We run from it. We pretend it's not there. We cover it up with all kinds of other stuff. We drowned our pain with all kinds of addictions. And we just hope that some way, somehow, they'll just go away. So we say, well, tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'll deal with that. It's time to take a stand for your own life and say, no more. No more. Jesus died to set me free, and I am going to cooperate with him. And I am going to let the Holy Ghost do a work in my life. And I am going to learn to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, to be happy, to have peace, to enjoy my life, and to be the person that God wants me to be. Don't stay angry. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 talks about anger. And it says that anger lodges in the bosom of a fool. Do not be quick in spirit to be angry or vexed. For anger and vexation lodge in the bosom of a fool. <laughs> and one last one, Proverbs 22, 24, also talks about the danger of anger. Make no friendships with a man given to anger and a wrathful man don't associate with. Anger is so bad, it's such a problem that God is telling us, if you know an angry person, then don't even get into a relationship with them because it's a dangerous thing. So Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would help us by your mercy and grace to stop being angry. Has anybody noticed that the world's a pretty angry place today? It's amazing, the anger. Anger on the highway. Anger in the stores. Everybody's angry. Well, I refuse to be angry because you can't be angry and happy. So I want to be happy. We're not going to let that emotion of anger control us. Did you notice in Ephesians 4 it says, when you're angry, don't sin. It doesn't even say that the feeling of anger is a sin, but it says if we don't control it, it's a sin. When somebody hurts you, the first thing that's going to happen is, oh. but because we have what? We talk about this morning, the fruit of what? Self-control. <laughs> we don't have to explode and we don't have to implode. We can deal properly with things and not let them eat our lives away. The dangers of impulsive behavior. The word emotions defined in Webster's Dictionary means feelings, to excite, to move out. Emotions means to move out. A complex, usually strong response that brings physiological changes and prepares you for action. So I can say it in a way that you'll understand it. It's like feelings, I don't know where they start, but they seem somewhere down in here. And they rise up. And they start to move out. And they want you to trot right along behind them. <laughs> and just do whatever they tell you to do. And that's exactly the truth. An emotional person is someone who relies too much on their emotions. And more than anything, if you listen to people, they tell you how they feel. And yet feelings are unreliable. They're just unreliable. They can be good. They can be bad. They can be there when you don't want them, not be there when you do want them. Have you ever wanted to feel really good about something and you just couldn't? Or have you ever felt really bad about something and you didn't want to? You wanted to go and do this, but you just didn't feel like doing it? We can't rely on our feelings. We have to learn to live beyond 
those feelings. If I woke up and felt depressed, then I was depressed. Dave said after I received a measure of healing in my life, he said, I, re he said, I remember driving down the highway at night coming home thinking, well, I wonder what she'll be like tonight. <laughs> I wonder if anybody's saying that about any of you. <laughs> Probably not. I'm sure you're all very stable, got it all together. An emotional person's conduct is ruled by their feelings. They do whatever they feel like. We talked this morning about emotional addictions that we have. There are physical addictions, addictions to substances that then begin to control us physically. It's unbelievable what people will do to get another fix, another pill, another drink when they have become an addict. And we should pray for people like that on a regular basis. Not be critical and judgmental and turn our noses up at them, but what a terrible thing to be addicted to something like that. But if you are one of those people or you're watching right now and you're one of those people, I want to tell you that Jesus is more than happy to set you free. When you feel the need for that thing that you depend on, instead of running to it, run to Jesus. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, God. Help me. Help me. Self-pity can become an emotional addiction. Our automatic response to not getting our way is to feel sorry for ourselves or to get angry. I lived like that for so many years. Every time I didn't get my way, Dave wanted to go play golf, and I didn't want him to go. We only had one television back then. If he wanted to watch sports and I couldn't watch anything. <laughs> over and over and over and over. Be around another relative that maybe had money and we didn't have hardly anything back then. And <laughs> Every day of my life was a, a waste and a torment. Because all I had to have was something that didn't go right. And my addiction to self-pity would show up. Depression can be the same way. Another thing that I was addicted to was having to have the last word. You say, what do you mean you, you were addicted to it? Well, I just couldn't seem to do without it. <laughs> I mean, to let Dave have the last word in any kind of an argument was just undoable for me. <laughs> I had to have the last word. And even when God really got after me and I started getting a little bit better, I would get out of the room and go have the last word. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and then I had to realize that it, it, that, that it was God that had to listen to it. And I was doing just as much damage to my walk with God if I did it in the room with Dave or out of the room with Dave. Uh-oh, got you, didn't I? You know, I don't have to have that now. You know what I've found out? Thank you, Jesus. Being right is highly overrated. That little thrill only lasts for a second, and who cares anyway? It is just not that big of a deal. The more humility we have in our life, the more we just really don't care who's right and who gets the credit. We have to learn to live before God and to do what's right ourselves, knowing that our reward is going to come from God, and stop worrying about what everybody else is doing or not doing. Come on, there's somebody here tonight you need to hear that. We need to make a decision to live our life before God. I'm not going to be responsible for Dave or my friends or my in-laws or my outlaws or anybody else. I am only going to stand before God for me. Amen? Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. No matter what kind of a mess you're in, if you will do what's right, God will bring a reward in your life. God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And oh, with all of my heart, I want to see people have the life that Jesus died to give them. That's the passion of my soul. I love to see people saved. Last night, almost 1,200 people gave their life to the Lord. But I'll tell you what my passion is. 
My passion is to see believers mature and grow up and be stable and not be ruled by the enemy and to get out there and let their light shine, to hold their head up and know who they are in Christ. The church should not just be a hospital for a bunch of pitiful, pathetic, broken down, barely get by. I mean, hey, you can come in that way, but let's not stay that way. Let's grow up in God. Those who live by and according to feelings are in danger of becoming emotionally addicted. But there's an answer to it. Let's look at Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in matters too great or in things too wonderful for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me ceased from fretting. <laughs> o Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Now, have any of you ever weaned a baby off of a bottle? Anybody here ever had a baby and you know what they act like when you take their pacifier away or <laughs> take their bottle away? Well, this is a good analogy, and I think you'll get it. If God puts his finger on something in your life, some kind of an emotional addiction or an emotional excessive habit, you know, anybody can have a good, a bad day once in a while, but, you know, if, if every day now you're down in the dumps about something and you've got all this self-pity and you get mad every time you don't get your way, then these are problems and we need to face that and ask God to get right in the middle of them and deal with them. Can anybody say amen? And you're going to be so much happier for it. It's wonderful to be free. It's amazing for me now when Dave wants to do something that I would rather him not do, and he can go do it, and I can be just as happy as if I would have gotten my way. That's freedom. Freedom is not getting everything you want. Freedom is being able to be happy when you don't get what you want. Did you hear me? Let me say it again. Freedom is not getting everything you want. It's being able to be happy when you don't get what you want. The peace that passes understanding. But when you're addicted to something and you're, you're accustomed to that, then you have to be weaned off of that. Just like a baby. When we would take, let's start with a pacifier. We'd take the pacifier, pacifier away from our kids when they were 11 months old. That was our system. Bottles went at 12 months. They got potty trained at 18 months. 11 months, we'd take the pacifier. I'm telling you what, the first night was miserable. Oh, what a temptation to give it back to them. <laughs> Screaming all night long. And we lived in a little three-room thing, little three-room flat-type thing in the city. And here was our bed, and here was the baby bed. So there was no putting a door between us and the screaming. All night long, screaming, screaming, screaming. Finally fall asleep. Wake up screaming, screaming. And then they'd snivel. You know how they <laughs> Second night, it wasn't so bad. By the third night, there wasn't the screaming, just the <laughs> And I found out that's just what my flesh does. <laughs> when you take something, when you say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I refuse to go feel sorry for myself. Your flesh has a screaming fit. When I started really making an effort to be a submissive wife, and Dave would tell me to do something that I didn't want to do, I'm telling you what, I would have to go into the bathroom and shove a towel in my mouth to keep from screaming out loud. <laughs> Does anybody know what that kind of rebellion feels like? Do I have any relatives in here tonight? Oh, but I so loved God, and I so much wanted to do what He wanted me to do. And I knew I had a call on my life, and I didn't want to mess it up. And I wanted to carry a strong anointing, and I knew that was affected in a measure by obedience. And it was hard, man. It was hard. 
And then I'd go back out in the house and I wouldn't want to talk to him and I'd stay away from him. If he came in the room, I'd go in another room and, you know, then God started to deal with me and he said, now get out there and talk to him. <laughs> then it got really bad. Go give him a hug. Oh God, that's too bad. No, I can't do that. Come on, how many of you know about all that resistance in your soul, okay? But you know, when I would practice that after, you know, a few, few go-arounds at that, then it wasn't such a screaming fit anymore. You, you know, every once in a while, my soul would still just go, just have that little snivel, but I'd be set free. And I want you to understand, when you know that God puts his finger on something in your life, and actually, I mean, this works the same way even if you're addicted to drugs. It was that way for me when I laid down cigarettes. I mean, the first few weeks, first week was really bad. And then every day after that just got easier and easier and easier and easier. You know, true freedom is not getting everything you want, but it's being able to be joyful and emotionally stable even when you don't get what you want.